Welcome to Screw the Commute, the entrepreneurial podcast dedicated to getting you out of the car and into the money with your host, lifelong entrepreneur and multimillionaire, Tom Antion. Hey, everybody, it's Tom here with episode 138 of Screw the Commute podcast. We're here with Sima Lieberman, and I've known this lady for, I don't know, maybe 100, 200 years or something, long before she was even born, I knew her. And uh, she's got a great company on inclusivity in the workplace. She's made a whole career out of this, so we're going to bring her on in a minute. Let's see, last episode was 137, Bobby Olson, and she talked about something I really suck at, I tell you, it's, but it's really important for your business, and it's the exciting topic of budgeting, yay, all right, but it is really important, so don't miss that episode, if you did miss it, it's a really important thing so that you don't belly up in your business. Now I got a big freebie for you to thank you for listening to this podcast. It's my $27 ebook, How to Automate Your Business. And just one of the tips in this ebook has saved me over 7 million keystrokes. And I also have a nice little extra bonus for you over there. So you can grab that at screwthecommute.com slash automate free. Screwthecommute.com slash automate free. Now our podcast app is in the iTunes store. You can Go to screwthecommute.com slash app, A-P-P, uh, where we have complete instructions to show you how to use all the fancy features so you can take us with you on the road and put it on your cell phone and tablet. And also, please tell your friends about this podcast. If you have somebody that's interested in starting a business or wanting to improve the business they have, this is the place to be. All right, our sponsor this week, hey, guess what? It's me again. Tom Antion's Internet Marketing Retreat and Joint Venture Program, where myself and my staff work with you for a year to either get you started in an internet business or to use the internet to take your existing business to the next level. And I'll tell you more about that later. All right, our sponsor this week is me again, Tom Antion's Internet Marketing Retreat and Joint Venture Program, where myself and my staff work with you for a year to either get you started in an internet business or to use the internet to take your existing business to the next level. And you can check all that out at greatinternetmarketingtraining.com, greatinternetmarketingtraining.com, and we'll have that in the show notes. But I do want to tell you just a little bit about uh, something that I, I turned kind of the internet world on its head around the year 2000 because people like me were charging Fifty or hundred thousand dollars up front to teach what we knew to business people. So I'm a small business advocate, and I knew many small businesses could never afford that kind of upfront money. So I made all those gurus mad by charging a relatively small entry fee to my program, but I also got a percentage of profits that was capped. So you're not stuck with me forever. So for me to get my big money, you have to make way bigger money. Plus, you know I'm not going to disappear on you because I won't get my money, right? So so then I even took it a step further. I have a big estate home and a TV studio uh, where my students, as part of their year-long training, come and actually stay in my house for an immersion weekend. And that's just one of the unique features of this program. So check out the full details at greatinternetmarketingtraining.com, and we'll have that in the show notes. All right, let's get to the main event, Sima Lieberman creates inclusive cultures where people love to do their best work and customers love to do business. She's a consultant, speaker, and author. And Sima produces and hosts the podcast Everyday Conversation on Race for Everyday People at www.raceconvo.com. And I listened to an episode, and what I was impressed with on that potentially volatile topic is that nobody's yelling and screaming. Everybody's actually talking and debating, which is a beautiful thing. And uh, I'm sure it wouldn't happen if it wasn't for uh, she being such a great host. So Sima, are you ready to screw? The I commute? am very <laughs> ready to screw. The commute. <laughs> All right, right, right. So boy, it's been a long time. I'm glad we're getting a chance to catch up. So tell everybody uh, what, you, what you're doing with this inclusive work you're doing. Well, I work with organizations to create environments where everybody loves to do their best work and customers love to do business. 
but it's even more than just love. People say, oh, I like to work in places where people love working there. Well, you, you could be a big party and people will love working there. But the idea is, do they love doing their best work? And is it inclusive of everybody? Because when organizations aren't fully inclusive, it means that they're losing some hidden genius. Because if everybody can't do their best work, then the organization is missing out on people's talent. So this is more than putting pool tables in and giving them free lunch or, or what? what? What's all included in inclusiveness? Oh, absolutely. It's looking at how do you access people's brilliance? How do you access their genius? I, I mean, I've worked in different places where I've talked to people, and particularly people from our, who are not white, but it, it happens with everybody. It could be the quieter person who says, well, they hired me. I was so excited to work there. But once I got there, nobody asked me my opinion. Nobody took my ideas seriously. And I didn't feel like I was really part of that workplace. So as a result, I stopped contributing. So either people stop contributing or they, and they retire in place or they leave and they work for your competition or they start their own business and they become your competition. Wow, that retire in place, that, that's really a cool statement right there. That kind of tells, tells the story, doesn't it? Yes, it's true. I've done it myself. <laughs> well, that's how you know. Huh? So, yeah. so now this isn't a male or female thing, right? This isn't uh, like, okay, they don't listen to the, the females and, and they do the males, or, or even males fall into the same thing. Yeah, it's both. It's, it's, we're looking at everybody. Now, it's mm -hmm. more often that women don't get listened to. Okay. And so what I do, too, is I work with women or anybody who's not being listened to, and I tell them, here's what you do. Somebody's trying to take your idea. Here's what you say. Somebody's trying to, uh, to shut you down. Here's what you say. So besides the consulting, the organizational piece, I also do a lot of coaching, too. Yeah, because some of this is going to be very individual, right? Yeah, because everybody has issues. I mean, somebody could be like the quiet person and maybe people don't listen to their ideas. And maybe that quiet person is not going to do well in brainstorming. So for that quiet person, maybe what you have to do is you talk to them one on one or you ask them to write down their ideas or English may not be their first language mm -hmm. and they're not going to do well in a brainstorming session. Or you have people like me. I'm an extrovert. I'll brainstorm all over the place. But then I miss out on hearing some of the quieter people's ideas. Right, right. So what tips would you have for small companies that don't have an enormous, you know, HR staff and layers and layers of management to, uh, to, to use what, what you have to offer? Oh, that's even better because you know how, when you first start out in an organization, maybe you have three people and everybody has a say, mm -hmm. but then you have 10 people, not as many people have a say, but everybody still thinks that they own the company. <laughs> right. Or you have 20 people, but before that, you had everybody could take vacation whenever they want, but with 20 people, you can't. So we have people look at when you're a small organization, what do you want your culture to look like? And once you know what you want your culture to look like, we could look at what do you need to do when you're first starting? Do you have to maybe clarify people's roles in the organization so people know who the owners are, who's not the owner? Or, okay, everybody does have a say. How are you going to listen to people? So it's better when you're just a small organization and you're just starting out because then you could actually make plans. You can make contingency plans. You don't want to wait until you have 200 people <laughs> and you haven't, made any, you, haven't, you haven't made any arrangements for your culture. And then what you end up with is you end up with a default culture where anything goes, nobody knows what they're doing, and people aren't very productive and they hate working there and they leave. Yeah, so so the first thing is is the main leadership needs to come up with uh, an a picture of what they want the company to be. Is that right? It starts with the leadership. It has to start with the leadership because they're the only people who have the power to make that happen. They look at how do they want the organization to be now? How do they want the organization to be later? Then the, if there's a senior team, then they have to get together with their senior team and say, okay, how do we want this to happen? And whether it's a small group or a large group, Whatever culture you create, you have to let people know, here's what we're doing, here's what we're creating, here's our values. And for me, working in inclusion, I have to look at how do you want to make sure that people get listened to and that they get heard. So how do you make sure, like in the hiring process, that 
someone is okay with that because you just, I think you just said about a person that got hired and was all excited and then found out that it wasn't the right culture for them. Well, we, what you do is you stop looking at it for a cultural fit because when people say, oh, we want a cultural fit, they usually mean they just want people just like them. Like I'm talking next week to a, I'm talking next week to a group of, um, of business men, primarily men from Asia. Wow. And oh, most of them yeah. are older. And the reason that they're bringing me on is because they're having a problem with the hiring. What it is, is that people tend to hire people who are just like them. They think that's the cultural fit. But people, but in this particular organization, most of them may be from Asia, but their market is international. Their market is global. Right. They have to know how to develop relationships with people from every single background. And if everybody they hire is exactly like them, it's not going to happen. So people have to learn how to develop relationships on their own with people who are different than them. And when they're doing hiring, it's best that you have more of a diverse panel of people hiring because if it's just one person usually one person will hire people who are just like them who they feel most comfortable with they say oh i want to hire somebody who i could have a beer with but maybe that person who could you could have a beer with they may be bsing you they may be conning <laughs> you they know how to get into your good graces and what ends up happening is you hire them and they end up screwing up not screwing the commute they end up screwing <laughs> up your whole organization yeah all right now i personally have no trouble stereotyping people all right, so, so I want to get your opinion on this. This Asian group of mostly men, is it a fair thing to say that that culture doesn't value women as much? No, not, in, not, this particular, not, not in this particular situation, because what's happening is more women are coming into the organization, but what they don't know how to do oftentimes is they don't know how to have those relationships with women. Like I mm -hmm. did some work with, with, I work with a lot of cops. And one organ, one one agency I was working with, the department I was working with, I was meeting with the lieutenant, and he said, "Look, we don't want to harass anybody by accident, but we're not used to working with women, right. so we just don't know what to say. We don't know what to do. We want to make sure because we may harass each other, but maybe that's not going to make women feel so comfortable." Right. Right. So it's not about not valuing women so much. It's about not knowing how or what do we do if we've always had the good old boys club. Right. And and I mean, this has happened. We always go to the strip club when we're bringing new people in. What's <laughs> going to happen when we bring in women or we're bringing oh, younger people? Maybe they don't want to go to the strip club or or you have young guys. You have like what people call tech bros. And the way that they bring people in is then they go on some, I don't know, white water rafting trip or whatever it is. I don't know. They go on climbing Mount Everest, whatever the <laughs> heck it is. But not everybody can do that. Right. So if you're only going to hire people who could climb Mount Everest with you or go white water rafting and go on a zip line, you're going to lose a lot of people who are really great unless the job that you're hiring people for is to do mountain climbing right, or right. to run a zip line. But other than that, no, it's not going to work. So what do you do? Like, you know, you see a lot of these team building activities um, <laughs> and they can be kind of boring. You know, if, if you did have a bunch of people that can climb Mount Everest and you got them playing shuffleboard, you know, that's not going to work either, is it? No, although I don't know, I may, unless maybe it's, well, actually, if you took everybody on a really great luxury cruise and they played shuffleboard, that could actually work. They might prefer that to climbing a mountain, you know, but team building, because people have an idea of what team building is. They think that team building is, I don't know, you do a crossword puzzles together or, <laughs> or going to, you know, climbing a mountain together or, or you're going on these trust walks or I don't, I don't know, you do things that, you know, where you're in danger of getting killed. <laughs> but, but what I see is team building. People make stronger teams when they get to know each other. And you have to find different ways for people to get to know each other. Well, some people do get to know each other better by doing a task together. Other people get to know each other better by talking to each other. So you have to figure that out. But you have to be able to create an environment where people actually get to talk and know each other. Because you have all these people, oh, we're going to do a team building exercise. <laughs> okay. So they all learn how to, I don't know, do like some walk, like 
a hundred thousand feet above, like on the Empire State, top of the right, Empire right. State building. They all do tightrope, so they all help each other because <laughs> they help each other survive. Big deal. Then they go back to work, but they're not working on any projects together. Got they just it. know how to walk across the Empire State Building, like that movie Bird on a Wire, or whatever it was <laughs> right. that they were doing. Okay, so but, here's what I do. Tell me what you think about it. Twice a week, we have a, a Zoom or a Skype meeting, and everybody tells everybody else what projects they've been working on, but then they absolutely have to tell uh, something at the end of what they did to improve themselves. And all yes. kinds of stuff comes out. Like, and I mean, it does, it's not only always improve. Like uh, Lakia said, Oh, I got these cheap sunglasses at, at uh, the dollar store and they were really cool looking. They only cost a dollar. And I said, oh, you're not old enough to remember, but there was a song called Cheap Sunglasses. And then so Larry goes and finds it on YouTube and starts playing it. And everybody's just having a good time laughing about that. And so is that one way you get to know people or, or what? Yes. Yes, it is. Because one thing that I really believe in is, I mean, you and I are both funny. So, you know, one of the things I really believe in is getting people to laugh. When people laugh, mm -hmm. that's when they find commonality together. But when you're just sitting around uptight, working on, I don't know, what's that thing called? Django, whatever it is. You know, when they're just doing stuff like that, it's not going to help them really become more comfortable with each other. Because ultimately, when you're a team, you want to be able to be comfortable. You want to be able to be comfortable taking risks together. All right. You so want to be able to be comfortable giving suggestions to each other. Right, right. And until you've laughed with people, you don't really feel that comfortable doing that. Got it. Got it. Okay. So let's take you back a little bit because this is an entrepreneurial podcast. So did you ever have a job? Well, what is, <laughs> it depends on what you mean by a job. Well, where you worked for somebody else for a paycheck, not your own business. Oh, I had maybe about 50 jobs <laughs> by the time I was about 25. Wow. Okay. Tell because, us that story. Yeah. You know, because you know how people always talk about millennials. They go, oh, millennials, they don't really have a good work ethic. They can't stay at a job. I'm thinking, who the hell stays at a job when you're young more than a few months, really? <laughs> I said I had about 25 jobs by the time I was 25. Like what? Oh, I okay, waiting tables. Okay. I, I always waited tables. And, when this, and then when invariably something would happen that I didn't like, I'd have to leave. Like one time they wanted me to work on New Year's Eve, but I had a date, so I had to quit. <laughs> okay. um, so I, so I would, so I had wait, I waited tables. I worked in really fancy clothing stores and I would pretend that something looked good on somebody because I was young. I didn't really know what I really didn't know what I was doing. I worked in an I worked at an art supply store. And at the time I was using a lot of drugs. So we would just I don't use drugs at all anymore, but at the time in the art supply store, I was in high school, we would just get high in the art supply store. What'd you do? Sniff the glue in there? What what'd you do? No, we just smoked pot and oh. did whatever else we could do. Well, it's legal now everywhere. So you... Yeah, but at the time, you know, they didn't really want us getting high at work. <laughs> and then uh, and then the other thing I did was I was did at the time it was called telephone soliciting. Mm -hmm. I sold aluminum siding. Oh. Now, I'm from the Bronx. <laughs> I only grew up in apartment buildings. With bricks. I didn't even <laughs> I didn't know what aluminum siding was. But I got more appointments than anybody else because I used my own script. Okay. But they would listen <laughs> into us. Uh, at the time, they used like phone extensions, yeah. you know, it was like dial up phone. <laughs> and then I got into a lot of trouble because I was going off script. But I was getting more appointments than anybody else. I still, I still didn't know what aluminum siding was, <laughs> but I was selling the hell out of it. Oh, man. So, what? So, uh, when did you start your own business and like, did you plan for it? Did you, uh, no. save up money? Uh, what, how, no. what was the transition? I didn't know anything. I really didn't. What, well, I wasn't in my own business, but I was working as a, uh, I was basically you could say as a contractor, I, my background, I had a ma got a master's degree in, in health education, really holistic health. Okay. And I was working in pain management. I was working at sports clinics. I was working at different medical offices, doctor's offices. I was working out of my house. I was teaching biofeedback. Was this all managing. New York area? Uh, 
no, in, in the West Coast. In oh, California. you moved that is by the time. Okay. Yeah. I, I was a crappy employee. You know, I really was a crap. No, but I used to think that there was something wrong with me because I was a crappy employee, but then I knew I wasn't meant to be one. And so I was working in, I'm working in, in this healthcare, I'm working as a contractor. So I still had to be at a, places at a certain time. And I lost my job. Uh, I, I, well, I lost, I lost the position and I was like crying and feeling really bad and saying, Oh, what am I going to well, do? Well, it seems like I'm you'd be lost. used to it after 50 jobs. Before you're well, and somebody <laughs> said, yeah, but you hated working for those people anyway. I said, yeah, but it was what I knew. And they said, nah, you hated it. You should start your own business. And I said, no, I can't start my own business. I don't even know what I'm doing. <laughs> so it was, I didn't know anybody that had a salary, salary job. Okay. I didn't know anybody in management. I didn't even know how business worked. But well, that's a perfect way to start. <laughs> no, nobody, nobody would hire me. And then people started giving me contracts. People started giving my own contracts to do workshops. I was doing workshops in, in stress management. And then out of my house, I was seeing individual people coaching them in stress management. Wow. And, th and then somebody said, Oh, you have your own business. And I said, I do. <laughs> they said, Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I said I am. I was going to, I went to a meeting of American Society for Training and Development. Somebody said, well, you should go to NSA, National Speakers Association, because you're a speaker. What year was and this? I said, like 1989 or okay. something like that. And I said, I am. And they said, <laughs> yeah, you are. And then the next thing I knew, I had a business, but I didn't know any, I really didn't know anything about business. I had no self-esteem, really low self-esteem. I didn't know. Oh, I didn't know what HR was. People talk about <laughs> HR okay. and I would just, but I had learned, I'm from the Bronx. I grew up in the Bronx near the Yankee stadium. You know, my family didn't have very much money. So what I learned was just to observe. Mm -hmm. I learned how to observe and I learned how to nod my head. <laughs> and then I go look stuff up like in an encyclopedia it was before the internet. Right. And so people would talk about HR. I didn't even know what HR was. I had to go look it up. <laughs> That's abbreviation for hour. I, yeah, I, mean, I, didn't, I didn't even know what OD was. I go, oh, okay, like the senior director. I didn't even know what that was. But I was still get. But I was getting contracts at the time. And the and contracts again for were for what? Stress management training. For stress management and wellness. And you were stressed out yourself. Right? I was. Oh, I was so stressed. I was really stressed out because I didn't know what I was. I didn't. I really didn't know what I was doing. And it took me several years before I understood what I was doing because I didn't understand. I didn't understand how business worked. Well, that I mean, were you getting your taxes paid worked? and and expenses and or was that a mess at the time? Um. Uh, uh -oh. Let's see. Can I plead the fifth? Yeah. <laughs> okay. I it was a little bit. Statute well, of limitations say, is running. <laughs> it, it was a little bit messy because I didn't understand. I didn't. I really right. didn't understand how all those. I really didn't understand how all those things worked. <laughs> and so then I started going to workshops. And actually, I. I mean, I really didn't. When I was at NSA, I didn't really. I mean, I learned a lot when I went to your workshop, yeah. believe it or not, about marketing and mm -hmm. business because it just what. It wasn't my thing. I wanted to get a job, but nobody would hire me. But I didn't really even, I really didn't want a job because I don't like people. I don't, I really don't like being told what to do. Right, right. So when and, did start, things start to gel a little bit for you where you felt more comfortable in business? Or did you ever? <laughs> I don't know if I, I don't know if I actually ever really did. But, um, but I, 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 about like, I'd say about 24 years ago things started, I, I started thinking of myself more as a business person and a real consultant, an organizational consultant, than just as a contractor. In fact, one of my first really big, one of my first six-figure contracts that I ever got, I was working with the CEO, but I had such low self-esteem. I didn't understand why the, C the CEO would just call me to get my advice. And I remember thinking, why is he calling me? He should have the HR person call me. What's he asking me for my advice for? Who does he think I am? I mean, it's really different now. But at the time, I didn't understand it until finally one of my friends said, don't you get it? You are an expert in what you do. You don't have to be an expert in what they do. You have to be an expert in what you do. And he's looking at you for your expertise. Right, right, right. That was a big, big revelation for you, I guess. Huh? That was a huge revelation mm -hmm. it really was and when people started 
asking me for my advice. It took a while, but when I got it, I really got it. Okay, so this is a good lesson for everybody out there is, is that you may think that why would somebody ask me for advice? But if you're an expert in your field, just because they're a big shot in some other field doesn't mean anything. They, they don't know your field like you don't know their field, but uh, they may ask you. So you don't have to feel bad when someone else asks you for your advice because they believe that you know what you're talking about on something that they don't or they wouldn't be asking you. And no, you know, and no matter what it is that you're doing, you're the expert in your field. If they were the expert in your field, they wouldn't need you. Right. So obviously they need you for something. And when I learned that, and I also learned that there sometimes there's no one right answer, that there's lots of other answers. And for me as a consultant, what's most important is that I understand process so that I can help other people find what they need to find by helping them go through the process. I don't have to know the answers. I just have to know how to help people get the answers. Right. Now, was it a big culture shock for a Bronx girl to move to the West Coast? I moved from the Bronx to Eugene, Oregon. Okay. Well, it's still West Coast. Uh, that was the biggest culture shock ever. <laughs> First of all, I did. Well, how okay. old were you? When I, when I moved to the West Coast, I was like 22. Okay. Well, what happened was I grew up in the Bronx and I would watch like these quiz shows, you know, how they used to have those quiz shows. Yeah. And I thought people don't really like this really don't exist. They're just making <laughs> these people up. And I thought they were all actors. And then I would watch like Donna Reed and I thought nobody's like this. Come on. You know, both my parents worked. They said, no, no, but mothers just stay home. <laughs> so then I moved to the West Coast. I moved to Eugene, Oregon. And I thought, oh, my God. These are the people from the quiz shows. And I called my mother. I said, Ma, these people are just like the people in the quiz shows. You wouldn't believe it. I said, and they live in private houses. I thought they were all rich, which they were not. But I thought they were all rich. Uh -huh. I thought you had to be rich to live in a house. But I mean, and somebody, I remember one day we were, going, we were going up into the woods. We were chopping wood. And somebody asked me if I'd ever seen trees before. <laughs> You know, it was before the internet. Yeah. So, you know, had I ever seen, I said, yeah, we have Central Park. Yeah. <laughs> so, so you went to Eugene, Oregon, but then you, uh, when did you go to California? Then I was in Eugene for about eight years. I've been in Cal, then I went to Cal, then I, I was in Eugene, then I went to Portland and then I moved okay. to California. I went to, I moved to California to study holistic health. Okay. Because I had been really unhealthy. When I moved to the West Coast, I gained like 70 pounds. Wow. I was I, oh, you're skinny. I, I, I never would have dreamed that in a million years. You're thin. You're like well, a I got I'd never been in a fast food place before. I got addicted to McDonald's. Wow. I was eating like two two Big Macs at a, at a meal and Coca-Cola. And I, and I got, I got that big. I, I was smoking. Oh, yeah. I had migraine headaches. I was like a total mess. So I had to change my life. So I started learning about holistic health because I, then I was in Portland. And then I said, I want to help other people. So I moved out to California. Wow. 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 Yeah. They need help out there. That's for sure. <laughs> that's for sure. Oh my God. <laughs> so, so what do you like best about working for yourself and what's the worst part? Well, the best part for me is I don't like people. To, I really don't like people telling me what to right, do. Right. I mean, I had one job for about three weeks. <laughs> uh, no, I did like, like one time when my business wasn't doing well, I said, okay, I'm going to take a job. So I took a job for three weeks and they didn't have, this is a long time ago and they didn't have computers that I said, Hey, I, I need to work on a computer. I have my computer at home. How about I work from home? And she said, no, we don't work for home from home. And I said, okay, next. And I left <laughs> because I just couldn't, I can't, or the other thing I can't stand is when people tell you what to do for no reason. Right. Right. Yeah. You know, I mean, for no, like you have to look busy. What do I have to look busy for? <laughs> so I like working for, by, for myself because I like having my own thoughts and I could really be myself. And plus I could be creative and nobody is telling me how much money I can make or can't make. Right. That's for sure. And I could be, and I could, and I could be creative. That's what I like the most. The thing I don't like the most about it is uh, I don't really just like working by myself so much anymore. Mm -hmm. I really like being part of a, of a community of other people who work for themselves. And so that's what I had to do. I've had to create a community of other people who also have their own businesses where we can actually hold each other accountable. 
because I tend to be, I tend to have uh, ADD. I mean, like real ADD, so I can get distracted very easily. So, I mean, is that why you're, uh, is there an actual association or that's why you're in that, that shared place that you're recording from right now? Um, well, that was originally why, but, uh, but not so much, but, you know, like things like National Speakers Association. Oh, okay, okay, sure. Or, uh, I work, I do stuff like with Alan Wives, the Society for the Advancement of Consulting, or I just bring different groups of people together. Like I bring four or five different people who work for themselves together. And I say, hey, let's let's talk, let's meet at once a month and let's share what we're doing. Let's ask each other for help because there's a lot that I don't know how to do. And I have to ask people for help. I either have to hire people or I have to ask somebody for help. Yeah. Yeah, that's for sure. Yeah, everybody needs help in business for sure. You, nobody can do it all. So tell everybody uh, uh, how they get a hold of you, what kind of things you could help them with, and uh, and the offerings that you have. Okay, you could uh, you could reach me at Sima S I M M A at Sima Lieberman S I M M A L I E B E R M A N dot com. That's my website, and. Uh, you could help me if you were looking for a great speaker on anything related to diversity, equity, and inclusion, or creating inclusive work cultures where people love mm -hmm. to do their best work. Yep. I'm the person that you need to call. And what you really love about me is that I make people laugh and I bring people together in ways to talk, in ways that other people don't, because I get people to be comfortable talking about being uncomfortable. Yeah, you had me laughing today about the quiz show. <laughs> <laughs> oh Still cracking me up. And, I'm going to tell everybody about that. <laughs> and so, so, and I, I consult. I, I, so I do a lot of consulting, organizational consulting. If you're looking to create the, a great culture in your organization, I facilitate. If you're looking for people, somebody who can facilitate meetings, facilitate workshops, and also speaking, I'd love to come and speak at anybody's conference. Or uh, if you're looking for somebody to MC a panel, and if you're looking for somebody who who doesn't take themselves too seriously, who can get people to laugh while talking about really in talking about deep subjects, but get people to laugh. And the other thing is I have a podcast on race and I'd love people to listen to my podcast. It's everyday conversations on race for everyday people. And you can find it at www.raceconvo.com. That's www.raceconvo.com. Yeah, I just listened to an episode today, and I, like I said, I was I was a little apprehensive. I haven't talked to you for a long time, and I thought this is this is the way things should be, you know, people with differing opinions talking it out and making their arguments without being so mean and rotten and uh, uh, so forth. So it was really really great. But do you still do any individual coaching? Oh yes, I still do. That. I do a lot of individual coaching. I, I, on what? I coach. Well, I coach leaders on how to be really inclusive leaders, how to be able to get the most out of their employees, and to be able to discover and uncover the hidden genius that their employees bring to organizations. Got it. Got it. Got it. So they can find this all on your website, right? Yes, and also I also coach people in building confidence. Okay. So we'll have uh, the links to her, all her stuff in the show notes. We've got to take a brief sponsor break. And then when we come back, we're going to ask Sima what's a typical day look like for her and how she stays motivated. So, folks, uh, if you want someone to hold your hand through all kinds of Internet stuff, Sima has been kind enough to mention that I kind of got her started. And a lot of people, she mentioned today that, a lot of people started because of me I, around 1994 is when I got in this and people started begging me to teach them. I never planned on being Mr. Internet Guru, but, but my mentor program is the longest running, most successful and most unique in the entire world. Basically, it's run continuously for 19 plus years now and thousands of people through it. So if you'd like to hear about that, you want some actual help not just throw money and then we disappear on you. <laughs> and I'm the guy and I have a whole team of people here with subject matter experts that you can make appointments with. They tutor you one-on-one. -on -one. They'll take over the screen of your computer to show you what you're supposed to be doing and they'll look at what you are doing. And so besides me and all of them, you, know, you can really make some rapid progress. So you can check that out at greatinternetmarketingtraining.com. Great Internet Marketing Training. Dot com. 
Okay, so let's get back to our super duper guest, my old buddy Sima. And uh, so, Sima, what does a typical day look like for you? Well, there is no typical day. I've actually tried to create typical days, but I don't have. <laughs> I guess I don't have the discipline for a typical day. <laughs> but what it normally what I do is when I'm being typical. What I do is, well, I get up. First, I get up early in the morning. I go work out. I have to work out every single day. What time do you get up? Well, I like getting up at 6. I like getting to the gym at 6.30. Okay. But I started doing a boot camp where I get up at 5.30, and I have to be there at 6. So I'm you working do a butt on, camp like on me. that. Yeah, I, making money sitting on your butt. I love that. That was the best thing. Oh, that is the best thing. And actually, because of you... I actually have written some some books that I actually make money on every month. And I just think about it, I'm making money sitting on my butt. There you I don't go. make a, a ton of money because I don't really do a whole lot to market the books, but people find them. Well, they're still so, bringing money in. Yeah, oh, they are. So a typical day was I have my like typical day starts the night before because I have to make my list of everything that I need to do and a little bit of a time thing on the next day. So then I wake up, I go to the gym, I eat my breakfast, I start making phone calls. So I call people I have to do, I have to do follow up. If I don't follow up with people, they forget who I am. Okay. So I do that. And then um, I, I write, like I do a lot of blogging. I write a lot of articles. I write a newsletter. I write for a couple of magazines. And if I, and hopefully I have meetings because I try to have as many, I try to have at least several meetings a week where I go to meetings uh, and where I, where I go to meetings to develop relationships with potential clients, but also to get business. And then there's the other times that I'm actually at a client site working. You know, like I mm -hmm. just uh, I just recently spoke at a retreat for a large a large company, and so that my whole day was going and, and speaking at the retreat, and it was it was great. I had such a great time because I love I, the piece that I love the most is I love working with clients. I love speaking or consulting and working with people. I love having an impact. But the other piece, marketing, I like it. I'm not, I'm, it's not like my strong suit. So I need motivation to do that. Because on the other hand, if I don't market, then I, then I'll, I need to be homeless. So I have to market. <laughs> yeah, especially in a high uh, uh, cost area you live out in Berkeley, right? Yeah, it's really expensive. It's really expensive. So I have to do the mark. I have to do marketing. And then I always make a point of talking to at least one other, either consultant or somebody who has a business so that we could share what we've done, for, that, what our plans are for the day, what we've gotten done, and also ask each other for help. Oh, that's nice. So you have like how many people in your little group? Well, there's about five in my very close group, but mm -hmm. then there's other people because oftentimes like we'll get a really, if we get a really big contract, then we have people that we call on to get big contracts. I also mm -hmm. have to write proposals for con for clients. So, it's, I mean, it's, it's constant movement. So you seem like a pretty high energy person. So do you really, but you said you had to stay motivated to market. Is it just to keep from uh, being homeless? No, it's to keep from actually stopping and reading a mystery. <laughs> you like that, huh? <laughs> yeah, I love to read. I love to read I'm telling you, my best friend is my Kindle. Oh, yes. I am always reading all the time. And I have to get motivated because if not, I want to know the ending of the mystery. Like, <laughs> who did the killing? So, oh, it's 10 o'clock. Oh, that's I know. Oh, it's 2 o'clock in the afternoon. Or I have to keep, I also have to keep myself off of YouTube. Oh, yeah. I know the feeling. Yeah. But the, the Kindle, I love the Kindle especially because every time I would go on a speaking trip, It'd be like I'd have like twelve different books I wanted to bring with me, and it's yeah. like the whole suitcase is full of books. And now it's all in one. You can have a thousand books in your hands. <laughs> yeah, because remember the remember the old days. I remember the old days when I'd carry all these books. Yeah. Oh my goodness, it was terrible. <laughs> but so for me, I the way I stay motivated is by I stay motivated. I call people up on the telephone, or or, or um, I have a Zoom call, mm -hmm. or I text. But for me, now, this is not true for everybody. You know, I know like people like Alan Weiss and other people like that are very internally motivated. So they don't really need to talk to other people. I'm one of those people that 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 do. And it took me a long time to feel comfortable with that because I used to feel like there was something wrong with me because I needed to be around other people to really be motivated or to be focused. And then finally, I realized, no, that's just how I am. Yeah. And if this is what helps me get things done, then this is what I need to do. 
And so that's that's real that's really what motivates me, being around other people or talking to other people. I'm not, I don't really, I'm not really a good team person. Like I don't want to be part of anybody's team, you know, where people tell you what to do. I don't want to be told what to do, and I don't want a bunch of rules. But <laughs> I do like having people where I could share ideas with and then I and then I get motivated because I say, Oh, what do you think about this? And they say, Oh, have you thought about that? Because I really believe in the synergy mm -hmm. of the group. Right, right. To me, that makes difference. The other thing that motivates me, I put dollar, I, I have post-its and I just put dollar signs on post-its. <laughs> That's cool. There you go. Oh boy. <laughs> so I'll tell you what, it's been really great catching up with you, Seva. And uh, uh, thanks so much. We're going to um, put all the stuff that you said in the show notes so people can go there and click on links and get over to your site see all the great offerings you have if they need coaching or they want to bring you into your, their organization. Boy, I know you're a blast. I've known you for a long time. So, <laughs> so thanks so much for coming on. Thank you. And thank you for, thank you for your years of generosity with so much of your intellectual property that you share with everybody. Well, it's my pleasure. That's, that's the way I roll. So, uh, so good. <laughs> so it's good catching up with you. Okay. Thanks. All right. So everybody that was Sima Lieberman. And uh, you'll have the correct spelling of her name in our show notes. And make sure you check out greatinternetmarketingtraining.com if you'd like to have uh, personal attention from my whole organization, me included. I don't sign you up and then disappear. I'm one of the main people you'll be talking to to help you with your business. And also uh, sign up for our uh, app, our Screw the Commute podcast app is screwthecommute.com slash app. Get your freebie at screwthecommute.com slash automate free. And next episode, our Monday episodes are usually in-depth training. And I'm having my uh, guy that does the back end of our podcast, uh, we're going to do a series. So this Monday, he's going to talk about all the things that go on after I give him the recording. And there's a lot of it, so you don't want to miss that episode. And then the following Monday, I'll talk to you about all I do on the front end of it to book guests and do all the stuff to get a good recording and uh, edit, all that stuff. So, so watch for those on our Mondays, and we'll have some great uh, interviews with great people like Sima. Not as great as Sima, of course. Of course but, not. Uh, we'll have interviews for you of other great entrepreneurs on Wednesdays and Fridays every week. And then also one other thing I want to keep reminding people of uh, is our special youth editions where uh, we like to highlight once a month some uh, young person, maybe up to 22 years old or early 20s, that's doing something entrepreneurial. You can get them in touch with me and we'll see if we can uh, get them on a special youth edition. So anyway, we'll catch you all on the next episode. See you later.